back with you once again, and some of you might know that I was born and raised down in southwest Missouri, down in uh, the Ozark Hills, uh, if you will, and down in the Ozark Hills, down in hillbilly country, we have a little phrase that we like to use from time to time, a little bit of a, a hillbilly proverb, if you will. It's a little phrase that goes like this, even a blind sow can find an acorn in a mud hole sometime. Now, that's a phrase for those of you who, uh, who are the uninitiated, or for those of you who have had the misfortune of growing up somewhere other than the South, what that phrase essentially means is that there are times in life when even the most inept and backward people can nevertheless stumble into doing something right, stumble into making a good decision, back in to uh, doing something correctly. Even the most inept among us will upon occasion do the right thing. Well, I thought that phrase was a little bit appropriate to start our show this week because last, uh, last week, last Thursday, to be precise, uh, last Thursday down in Cleveland, our very own blind sow in chief, Barack Obama, managed to find an acorn in the proverbial mud hole. Obama did an economic speech uh, in Ohio, Cleveland to be specific, on Thursday, the big battleground state that everybody wants to win for the election. And in the midst of his usual speech, a 50-minute bore fest of the usual lies and mischaracterizations that we've come to expect from President Barack Obama, I mean, after all, the speech started out with the line, it's great to be back in Cleveland. Is there a bigger lie you could tell? Yee. But nevertheless, in the midst of all of the lies and the mischaracterizations and everything else that you have come to expect out of a Barack Obama speech, there was a small, a very small passage in the speech where he actually said something that not only made sense, but was a very accurate representation of a part of the political environment today. So, magnanimous as I am, man that I am, I can come out here in public and I can praise Barack Obama on the rare occasion that he's right on something. And I'm going to do that right now. Here is the very small sliver of his Cleveland speech where Barack Obama actually <gasps> made sense. Hit it. There have been fierce arguments throughout our history between both parties about the exact size and role of government. Some honest disagreements. But in the decades after World War II, there was a general consensus that the market couldn't solve all of our problems on its own, that we needed certain investments to give hardworking Americans the skills they needed to get a good job, and entrepreneurs the platforms they needed to create good jobs, and we needed consumer protections that made American products safe and American markets sound. It's this vision that Democrats and Republicans used to share that Mr. Romney and the current Republican Congress have rejected in favor of a no-holds-barred, government is the enemy, market is everything approach. Well, I, I've got to tell you, uh, while that was a very small part of his speech, and, and it's certainly not the focus of it, I have to tell you that that small passage, at least in my estimation, marks the first time in the last three plus years that I have seen Barack Obama exhibit some level of understanding of why people oppose him. You know, up to now, it's always been the usual excuses that the Democrats and the left throw up. Oh, people are just opposing him because of racism. Oh, people are just opposing him because they just want to obstruct for the sake of obstruction. Oh, it's, it's, it's just partisanship is the only reason that people oppose Barack Obama. And they even go so far sometimes to point out uh, certain things that we oppose that in the past Republicans were in favor of, like Obamacare or similar parts of it anyway. And so they always put up this stuff about any opposition to Obama is something more nefarious. But that particular little clip was the first time that I've seen Barack Obama actually acknowledge the reason that people oppose him. The reason that there has been a change within the Republican Party and within the conservative base. He accurately identifies this change in GOP policies. 
I mean, when he talks about the consensus that both parties used to have, he's absolutely right about that if you look at history. That's true. But what Barack Obama does not mention in his speech, and what I've not heard him mention yet, is that this change that he accurately identifies is the result of a generational change in the grassroots of the GOP. More and more voters today are beginning to question the very idea of an active and involved federal government. We're starting to say, hey, is, is an active federal government a good thing, necessarily? Or is it harmful? You know, the consensus that Obama talked about was very real in the days of people like Dwight Eisenhower or Richard Nixon or, to a degree, even George W. Bush. There was an idea that government, when implemented effectively, can potentially be a useful tool in improving society. Now, in those days, the 50s, the 60s, even part of the 90s, in those days, both parties would disagree to the extent to which government needed to play a role, but you would never really see a situation where either party questioned the concept of involved government outright. You never really saw Republicans even do that very much, with the notable exception of Barry Goldwater in 1964, and, so, and some points certainly in the Reagan administration. But by and large, while the Democrats were out there championing the idea of a strong government, frankly, the Republicans weren't too far behind. They might want to slow it down a little bit, but they really didn't want to uh, question the very idea of government. But this new generation of conservative voters, these younger voters, under, let's say, the age of 40, we are at long last forcing America to finally have that discussion. Now, a lot of people wonder why some of this new generation can think as we do. And, and you'll humor me. I, I, I consider myself a part of this younger and newer generation of conservatives. I'm in my late 30s, but this, this means that in, in politics, this may be the last point in life where I can call myself a younger generation of anything. But a lot of people wonder why we're even bothering to question the idea of government. Are we nuts? Are we off our rocker? Have we lost it? Well, I think there's something very simple and, and almost even obvious that our critics are overlooking. A little thing called age. You know, when you think about it, those of us who are in this newer generation, 40 years of age and under, if you do the math, you'll see that we have grown up entirely in an era after the implementation of things like Lyndon Johnson's War on Poverty, or after the implementation of Social Security, after the implementation of Medicare, after all of the environmental regulation that got started in the early 70s, after the implementation of things like affirmative action, after some of the civil rights legislation that came and went, after federally funded public education, and a myriad of other government big ideas. We've grown up after all of this stuff was implemented. So in a way, we're a little divorced from the emotion that was prevalent when a lot of these programs got uh, got shoved down our throats, or when those programs got implemented, you know, and, and dare I say, when Americans of both parties might have overreacted to some of the societal ills of the time, we've never gone through that. So we are uniquely positioned to be able to look at these programs and their effects and make perhaps a better judgment than previous generations could of whether these programs have been good, bad, or indifferent. Well, we're looking at these programs. We see all the affirmative action and the war on poverty and the welfare and all of this and that. And it strikes us, having grown up with those programs all of our lives, it strikes us that even so, even with all of those programs going on for so long, we still do not seem to see any sort of real improvement in society from those programs. We still see the same sectors of society still complaining and still with their hands out despite all that the rest of America has done to provide them with practically everything they want on a silver platter. And so it's this generation that's questioning it. You know, previous generations of Republicans could sometimes be guilted, for lack of a better term, into funding or keeping programs for the poor or the disadvantaged. But this generation, we're willing to call the left's bluff. You don't believe us? Look back to some of the debates, the presidential debates we had earlier in the year. Remember the one where uh, Wolf Blitzer was, was asking a question of Ron Paul about a, a hypothetical 30-year-old guy without health insurance and what if he gets sick? And someone in the crowd, someone in the crowd yells, let him die! And everybody in the media was just aghast. How could they do that? But I'm sitting there at home 
practically yelling the same thing. And so were a lot of other people. It was a surprise to everybody but us. We are willing to question these sort of things. We are willing to make that statement that maybe it's not the government's place to save us all from ourselves. And maybe it's not the government's place to save us all from our own bad decisions. I'll give you another example. Again, from some of the presidential debates. And even from a, this even happened actually at a senatorial debate I saw about a week ago. You've actually seen in some of the Republican presidential debates a question come up about if you became president, what are the first three federal agencies that you would cut? And it's not just in the presidential level. Uh, as, I, as I said, we have a senatorial race going on in Missouri right now, a primary to see who's going to take out Claire McCaskill in November. I was at a senatorial debate about a week and a half ago in St. Charles, Missouri, and that same question came up. What three, got, what three federal programs would you cut? And that question got the biggest crowd reaction of the night. I mean, the gallery cheered when that was asked. And they cheered when, when one of the candidates said, I'll cut the Department of Education. And when you think about it, that type of question and that type of answer and that type of response never would have happened at a Republican debate 30 years ago, but it will happen today. And it will get positive reaction today because of this new generational change. You know, it's, it's a generational shift that is similar to that that the Democrats went through themselves in the late 60s and early 70s. It's a situation where a new generation of voters growing into a party is not willing to accept some of the ideas of the previous generation and they want to take our ideas much further i hate to compare ourselves to the hippies of the 60s but there are structurally anyway some similarities you know back in the late 60s and early 70s for about a six eight ten year period there there were a lot of longtime democratic politicians that had to change their tune on things like the vietnam war or things like civil rights or any number of other things so that they can placate this newer generation of Democratic voters that were coming in and effectively taking over the party. A takeover that was complete by 1972 and exists to this day. Well, I think we're going through the same thing now. I think a lot of Republican politicians that might have been in favor of something like Obamacare in the past now know that they cannot be because we are the key to their power and we forbid them to be in favor of it. Now, for all of this talk and for all of this recognition, don't get me wrong. It's not going to change Barack Obama's political course on, on anything. It's not going to change his political focus. I doubt that he's pragmatic enough to shift towards a more anti-governing stance, even if the electorate is clearly moving in that direction. He's too much of an idealist to do that. I mean, you can look at Obamacare for a great example. There was a program that even Democrats said, hey, if you really put all your political capital behind this and you put all of your political chips on this hand, you're probably not going to get reelected. You're going to you know, divide the country and piss off that half the country. You're going to have a real tough time in 2012. Well, he got behind it anyway. He put all of his political capital behind it anyway. And what happened? The country got divided. He pissed off half the country. And he's going to have a real tough time getting reelected in 2012. Hey, to say I told you so, but yeah, we told you so. So Obama's not going to take this into account. And in fact, even in his speech, you heard, he, he was uh, making these statements very derisively, almost making fun of those of us who are questioning the very idea of government. But nevertheless, it is a certain degree of acknowledgement and recognition by a president and by a party that up until now has consistently misrepresented and outright lied about the motivation of those of us who oppose him. Maybe. Just maybe, this might be the very first step towards actually having a national discussion over whether the very concept of active governance is a positive or negative thing. Maybe this will be the first step in having a national referendum on government, if you will. It's a discussion that we on the right, we in the Tea Party, we in this younger generation of conservatives. It's a discussion that we have been begging to have for the last three or four years, but up until now, we've always been thwarted by whatever hurdle has been thrown in front of us. You know, cries of racism or obstruction or whatever. But now that this acknowledgement is out there, maybe that discussion can finally start to happen. I mean, can you imagine a political environment somewhere down the road in the future where both parties are competing with each other over how much government each of them can cut? I can imagine that. I can see that dream. I'm not telling you it's going to happen today or tomorrow. I think it's going to be a long way down the road, but I can see us getting there. But a lot of getting there 
involves that first step of having these type of discussions today over what the proper role of government is and how much government we really need. Having those discussions in the public square is the first step towards that, and it's a discussion that the left has not wanted to have for a long time, but now they're sort of being forced to. Obama finally understands what our opposition is, or at the very least, one of his speechwriters understands it. In this election year, I, I fully believe that Americans will and should stop allowing themselves to be held hostage by the, the poor, to use the air quotes, and the less fortunate when they step into the voting booth. After all, those people have their own votes, don't they? Let them vote for themselves. We are the first generation of Americans to recognize the negative results of allowing ourselves to be held hostage by those people in the past. We are the first generation to look at something like the Great Society and then look at the inner cities as they stand today and say, you know what? Really didn't do much good. It did a lot more harm than good. A lot of us are willing to look at public education and say, you know what? That really wasn't all it was cracked up to be, was it? We're willing to look at welfare and social security and say, that's doing a little bit more harm than good. We're willing to have these discussions that conservatives and Republicans of the last 20 and 30 and 40 and 50 years were scared to death to have or even didn't want to have at all. And yet Obama, while realizing to a degree that this change is certainly there in the electorate, as he acknowledged in his speech, he seems to be doubling down on his appeal to the victims and only the victim strategy. It's almost like if you're not a victim or you don't sympathize with victims, Obama's not talking to you. But with an electorate that's finally saying enough is enough, I'm sick of footing the bill for all the so-called victims, it seems to me that in that political environment, a sitting president who is appealing to nobody but those who wish to be viewed as victims, seems to me that's political suicide. And the political suicide will be complete in November of this year. And then we can really start to have that discussion of how much government is too much government. That's it for this week. This is America's Evil Genius. See you next week.